Good morning, friends, and welcome to Sabbath School Study Hour. Coming to you here from the Granite Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church, I'd like to welcome our online members and also those who are watching on the various television networks. Always a joy to be able to get together on Sabbath morning and study the Word of God. I'd also like to welcome our regular members and our visitors, always here Sabbath morning. Good to see you today. We're working our way through our lesson quarterly, dealing with the gospel in Galatians. Actually, today we find ourselves at the very end. We're on lesson number 14, entitled Boasting in the Cross. That's lesson number 14. Usually there's 13 uh, lessons in a quarter, but we have an extra one this quarter. Our final one today is Boasting in the Cross. We will be starting a new lesson study next week, and I'm very excited about this. This one's on the book of Romans. So for our members right here, those who are visiting, you might want to get a copy of our study guide for next quarter. Also for our friends who are watching, I encourage you to contact the local Adventist church and you can get a copy of the lesson or you can download at the Amazing Facts website at amazingfacts.org and you can start preparing for next week's study on the book of Romans. Before we get to our singing this morning, we do have a free offer that we'd like to tell our friends watching in North America they would like to receive this book entitled uh, Hidden Eyes and Closed Ears, the number to call for that is 866-788-3966, and you can ask for offer number 726. The number again is 866-788-3966, ask for offer number 726. We'll be happy to send this to anybody in North America. If you're outside of North America and you'd like to read this book, just go to the Amazing Facts website, amazingfacts.org, and you'll be able to download the book and read it there. It's time for us to sing, so I hope you're ready to lift your voices in song. I'd like to invite our song leaders to come forward, and we'll start by singing together. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And we have been warming up our voices here at Granite Bay, and so we are ready to join with you around the world. So I encourage you, if you have a hymnal, pull it out and join with us on 306 draw me near this goes along with the theme of our lesson today and we're going to do all three stanzas three zero six Is that your prayer today and every day? Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. Continuing with this theme, we're going to sing, I know, a favorite around the world, Near the Cross. This beautiful hymn you can find on 312 in your hymnal. And we're going to sing the first, second, and fourth stanza, 312.
that day is coming very soon when you see what is going on in this crazy world very soon rest beyond the river at this time pastor ross is going to have our opening prayer for us let's bow our heads for a word of prayer Dear Father in heaven, what a privilege to be able to gather in your house this Sabbath morning and open up your word and study together. Father, we recognize the Bible is your book, and in order to correctly understand it, we need the leading of the Holy Spirit. So we'd ask once again that you would come and speak to our hearts and our minds as we look at this great theme of the cross, about that plan of redemption that is being provided for each of us that we might be saved. Bless our time together today, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our lesson today is going to be brought to us by our new family life pastor here at the Granite Bay Church. We're delighted that Pastor Sean Brumman is with us, and he'll be bringing us our lesson. Thank you, Sean. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all here in Granite Bay, our family's new church. And uh, it is such a blessing to be able to come together on Sabbath school and to be able to study one more time, this great book that God has given to us, the book of Galatians. And uh, it's also good to be able to study with all our online members, as well as those who are watching on TV. And um, I want to uh, start by sharing a bit of a story. And this particular story just happened a couple of weeks ago. And uh, my wife uh, shared with me as she came to me with a very serious look on her face because she had received a very disturbing text on her cell phone. And uh, this particular text had uh, uh, come to her from a random stranger as we looked it up online or searched it somehow on Google and discovered uh, where this phone number had come from. We discovered that it was somebody in the Bay Area. Somebody in the San Francisco Bay Area had texted her. Now, I have to say that uh, everything on that text is not repeatable here in our lesson study today. <laughs> Uh, the beginning of the text started to uh, tell Denise that she needs to get her act together and uh, then it went on to use some very colorful language that again I won't be repeating here uh, today. Uh, the most disturbing part of that particular text is that it went on then to threaten her life and uh, also the life of her children. And uh, so not exactly the nicest welcome to America. And, and some of you know that I'm from Canada and our, families, our family has moved here uh, uh, from Canada. And, uh, but even as I say that, I have to say that on every other front, coming here to America has been positive. And uh, I'm just so thankful for the warm welcome that we have received from the Granite Bay Church. Uh, we have beautiful neighbors, wonderful neighborhood that we live in here in Carmichael at the time. And, uh, you know, on every other front since we've been to America, we have uh, seen nothing but positive, and we're very, very thankful for that. But this particular experience was not quite as, as positive. Now, as you can imagine, when Denise showed me that particular text, it was uh, not only disturbing to her, but it got my goat very quickly. And uh, my blood pressure went up, uh, my temperature went up, and uh, I found myself very disturbed and very concerned uh, by the wording of this particular text. At the same time, I have to say that what lighted me up at the moment, and uh, especially after the day had come when we received this text, is the knee-jerk reaction that I soon discovered Denise had already texted back to this particular culprit. And uh, when I looked at her response, I was surprised and, and uh, a little bit uh, found it humorous that uh, her first word with an explanation mark was whatever. <laughs> and uh, I thought to myself, in fact, our family has been kind of giggling and making light of it since because we, we've been kind of um, uh, imagining this kind of hardened, psychotic criminal hiding in some dark room in his house in the Bay Area, texting death threats to random different people. And, uh, and then when Denise had responded, his head's cocked and he's looking a little bit puzzled as he looks at it and says, I've never got a response to a death threat this way, whatever. <laughs> now I have to say that when I went on and continued to read that particular text, uh, Denise went on and said, you know, listen, I think it's important for you to understand that you are never to text this number again and that you have uh, been reported. It's interesting, over the next day, he ended up texting her again anyway, but this time with an apology. 
And uh, as it turns out, Denise had just received this new number as we got our cell package here in, uh, in Sacramento. And uh, so it must have been a previous owner of that particular cell number. And uh, so he was intending to reach a woman by the name of Blaney, he said. And I apologize, it wasn't intended for you. The other thing that we had discovered as we had uh, researched and looked at what the authorities do on such a, an event as this, because we were not only concerned for our lives, but then we began to be concerned about this other woman. You know, sure, it's not intended for us, the apology accepted, I suppose, but what about this other poor woman? As it turns out, the authorities don't respond to death threats unless it comes at least two times. At least two times. So I guess the the rationale behind it is that most, or I'm guessing and hoping all of them, survive between the first death threat and the second death threat. And uh, I hope that's the case in, in every case when it comes to this kind of activity. When the Apostle Paul learned that the new churches in the area of Galatia were being misled with a very serious heresy while he was away from that particular area, away from those churches in which he had planted. And on top of it, and even worse, Paul had discovered that the bulk of the new believers were falling for it. He too was very understandably upset. He too was also disturbed. He too was also very concerned about what was going on in these precious churches that he himself again had planted. Now, rather than texting back, he had done something different. Uh, the Lord had called him to be a prophet, and so uh, he, the Lord sent him to pen and paper. And when he went to pen and paper, he wrote out a very inspired, important letter that straightened things out as best as he could in that particular area. I'd like to invite you as we open up to Galatians, Galatians uh, chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, as we wrap up the last verses of this important book of the New Testament. Galatians chapter 6. And we're going to start with verse 11, right to the end of the chapter, right to the, through to the end of the book. Again, as we have already heard through our introduction, we're in the book of, of Galatians. We're finishing our last study. For those of you who might be just tuning in, uh, the Gospel in Galatians is the book that we're reading, or, or at least the study guide that we've been going through, and it's the last study guide, number 14, Boasting in the Cross. And so we're just going to go ahead and and read those last seven or eight verses. Verse 11, it says this, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus." Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now, as we come to verse 11 in particular, as we look at this last passage, but not just the last verses in particular, but uh, starting with the very first verses and all the way through the letter, if there's one thing that we discovered very quickly is that the author, in this case the Apostle Paul, was a very riled up shepherd a shepherd of a flock in which he himself had birthed many of those believers in which he was writing to, which he was concerned about. And the reason he was a riled up shepherd is because wolves had come in among the sheep. And he had a very personal investment in these particular believers and sheep. And so Paul makes it very clear that he wasn't going to stand by and let them be devoured with a heresy that would effectively bring them into the very experience that Christ had delivered Paul from several years beforehand. Now, as we come to verse 11, we find here that it points out uh, to its readers, to its listeners, its original readers, its original listeners, to how personally involved and concerned Paul was for them. It's a very unique statement that I don't believe Paul makes in any other part of his writings in the New Testament. 
in the Bible. Verse 11 again says, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. You know, sometimes when we're emailing somebody and, and we're not using audible voices, obviously when we email, perhaps even when we're texting, but probably more often when we're emailing, and we're really excited about something or we're upset about something, and, uh, and, and so what do we do? We don't just use the regular font. We take the regular font of 10 or 12 size, and we might bump that up to 14 or maybe even a 16 size. And then if we really want to say something just a little bit louder than that, what do we do? All right, somebody says we click on the bold. All right, so we choose the bold option. And then somebody else says here also the capitals. So we choose the capitals. So now we have bold capitals with an enlarged font. What have we done when we've done that? What do we hear when we read that? All right, we hear somebody raising the volume, don't we? Somebody said shouting. All right, so here, most likely, the most reasonable interpretation here is that Paul is saying, as he wraps up this particular letter, uh, he says, listen, I'm pointing to the fact that I'm using large capital bold letters uh, because I'm trying to raise the volume. We find that same principle kind of found now. Of course, they didn't use bold. They didn't use larger fonts and capitals. And in fact, there were no capitals. There was no punctuation in the original Greek that Paul was writing in. And uh, so their writing style was much different than ours, but uh, they used uh, words to be able to say that. And so he points out to his large letters. In this case, Revelation chapter 13 is another passage that came to mind. And uh, there's an introduction there as we come to the first angel's message. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a... Okay, many of you know it off by heart. That's good. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, and so on and so on. And then as we come down to the third angel's message, here we find that the volume is also revealed to be turned up. And a third angel followed, saying with a loud voice. And I believe that's verse 8 as we continue on, or verse 9 as we continue on down to that third angel's uh, message. And so why do you suppose that God would want to turn up the, the volume when it comes to the third angel's message? The three angels message in general. Why? Because it's a life and death issue, isn't it? In fact, by the time you get to the third angel's message, he very clearly tells us in the strongest language, hey, this is life and death. And God wants us to choose life, doesn't he? And so he says, listen, I'm going to turn up the volume because what I'm saying right now is of utmost importance, especially in the very last years of history. And so we need to turn up the volume as a church, don't we, with the third angel's message. We don't need to start to try to put it aside and try to come up with something else. No, God wants us to turn it up louder than ever before. And uh, in fact, prophecy tells us that that's what we'll be doing as the spirit rains down upon us and we come into the latter rain. Uh, there's going to be a powerful increase in the volume of the three angels' message. One of the largest challenges that the original Christian church faced was how many, how, was how the many thousands of first Christians, the original Christians, who were all predominantly Jewish, by the way, were going to accept and deal with a growing population of Gentiles or non-Jewish people that were also accepting Christ as the Messiah, that were also becoming Christians and becoming members of the church. And uh, this was no small challenge. In fact, this challenge was so large that it almost split the church. And so the very first serious challenge to the unity of the church took place over the issue that's being discussed in a large manner in the book of, of Galatians. There was a number, growing number of, of Gentiles that were coming in. God was choosing different evangelists, missionaries such as Philip, Paul, Barnabas, and uh, several others that were bringing in this growing population of Gentile Christians. Now, the reason that this is such a challenge to the church that was predominantly Jewish is that a good Jewish family always r raised their children in that generation to look down their noses at those who were not Jewish by race or by faith. And, uh, and so, in fact, they even referred to quite often to non-Jewish people as dogs. And uh, they were an unclean animal in their, in their minds and in their hearts. And so there was some very real prejudice that was taking place uh, from that of the Jews towards those who were 
those who were not. In fact, if you kind of brushed up against a non-Jewish or Gentile person or maybe you ended up inadvertently drinking from the same cup or, God forbid, you ended up at the same table eating with them, why you would become religiously and spiritually defiled. And so the Jewish fathers had developed a whole system of traditions and practices to be able to deal with this. And so they came up with this kind of ceremonial washing where you had to go before you ate and wash, you know, with this kind of special consecrated water up to the elbow and down to the bottom of your hand before you ate a meal so that you could re-undefile yourself just in case you had inadvertently touched something that a non-Jewish person person had, had touched. And so that was a big challenge uh, for the Jewish Christians. This was no small thing to be able to undo in their minds and their hearts. Now on top of that, the second question that they had is should we be compelling, should we be telling these new converts to observe the ceremonial law of Moses? Okay, should they observe the ceremonial law of Moses including the act of circumcision? Which was also wrapped up in that, starting with Abraham, but it was also in the covenant with Moses and with the Israelites in Sinai. Now, in addition to that, I think it's also important to understand that they were also asking themselves and wrapped up very inseparably in the mind of a religious Jew back in that generation was the traditions of the fathers, such as the ceremonial washing. The very washing that Jesus kind of uh, snubbed his nose at and said, really, that's irrelevant, it's man-made, it's not inspired, it's not in the Bible. And, uh, and, but it's a system of works that had been developed in addition to the ceremonial law of Moses that Moses himself had written in the Torah. And so this was essentially inseparable in the minds of the Jews and even of these early Christians and probably even to a large degree in the apostles as they were working through this as well. And so should we compel them to follow the traditions of the fathers? Should we compel them to follow the laws of Moses and the ceremonies and the sacrifices and the feasts that were found in the writings of Moses? Now, as it turns out, circumcision, circumcision is one of those visible signs that is very easy to be able to to discover, at least from a man to a man. And the reason I say that is back then, the men, uh, more commonly than not, found themselves cleansing themselves in public bathhouses, Roman bathhouses, maybe the Jews had separate bathhouses. I'm not quite uh, exactly educated on if there was a separation there, but the men would share gymnasiums and bathhouses and so on, and so they were able to see each other in their birthday, birthday suits quite often. And, uh, and so if, the man, if a man sees your, you in the shower or in the bathhouse and you're circumcised, why that was an immediate sign that would tell that observer that you had both accepted and submitted to the Old Testament covenant of Moses and of the Israelite in Judaism. And so it was a very fitting symbol, uh, circumcision, to really represent the whole package deal. And so when Paul mentions circumcision, I think it's important for us to understand that he's talking about more than just circumcision, But he's using that as a symbol of the whole package of both the traditional fathers' uh, theologies that they had added to the Bible as well as the writings of Moses and the ceremonial law itself. God had led Paul and Barnabas to understand that Gentiles were not unclean dogs inferior to the Jews. Now this was a natural thing because Paul and Barnabas had been commissioned by God, had been ordained by God to go and to bring the gospel to the Gentile populations. They went way beyond the the borders of Israel, left the majority of the populations of the Jews behind, and they uh, predominantly labored and were winning people from the Gentile populations to Christ. And so it was a very natural thing for God to work with them first, right? And so they were the first ones to see the light uh, clearer than the rest of the church, even the apostles, in regards to the fact that God God has no partiality to any single human being. Every single person, no matter what your race, your ethnicity, your culture, no matter what it is, God sees us all equal on an equal plane, amen? And, uh, And so Paul and Barnabas were one of the first ones to understand this and see it in its clearest light. Um, They also were brought to understand that observing the law of Moses was not part of God's plan for the non-Jewish Christian. And uh, and so they continued on baptizing Gentile people, but not instructing them to keep 
the ceremonial feasts and the sacrifices and, and the different laws that were written out, both in the writing of Moses, as well, again, in that generation, also the writings of the fathers. That was also a very real part of their Judaic experience. Now, the problem that the church faced was not all were on board at the same time. Even some of the apostles were still working uh, uh, through this. And so it all led to a very heated conver a con conversation, a very heated conference that took place in the city of Jerusalem among the leaders, including Paul, that eventually concluded that Gentiles were not required to observe the writings, or not the writings, I should say, but um, to observe the uh, ceremonial law of Moses nor the traditions of the Jewish fathers. Now we can read all that in the book of Acts. So if you've never read the book of Acts, it's a good book to go to be able to see the background of that because every detail of that day took, that took place is written in that important chapter. Now as a result of that particular conference, the apostles then commissioned, described to be able to write up a letter that confirmed this conclusion and then they sent those letters out to the existing churches. Now this is a good lesson for us in regards to God's plan for an organized church. God has always intended for all of us to work together, not just as a local congregation, but as a worldwide congregation, amen? And so God has called us into a worldwide family of believers. And, uh, and so Jerusalem just didn't kind of decide this and said, you know what, you guys in Antioch do whatever you want, uh, we're gonna do what we want here, no. Uh, they sent letters to all the existing churches from Jerusalem, which at that time was what we would call the GC or General Conference of the Church. And, uh, and then the rest of the church would take heed to that decision that was made at this highest level in conference. Now, as a result of receiving this, different members that were hearing this letter being read in their churches for the first time spread out through Israel and beyond even Israel at this time. Uh, but the Jews in particular, that were of a humble and of a teachable spirit, came to see the light in this. And they allowed the Holy Spirit to lead them to overcome this prejudice that they've been conditioned in in regards to their view of non-Jewish populations, non-Jewish people, that they weren't superior simply by race, but they were equal with Gentiles. And also, just as importantly, they allowed the Holy Spirit to help them to understand that indeed the sacrificial system had been fulfilled in Christ, to allow them to start to see that the Old Testament temple had fulfilled its purpose and now was a very interesting sacred relic, but really now we have a New Testament sanctuary in heaven in which Christ himself is our high priest. He's our priest, he's our sacrifice, and he's in a heavenly temple. And so all those three elements that are wrapped up in at the very center of the ceremonial law was now fulfilled in Christ. And we have a New Testament system that's in heaven not on earth. And so they allow the Holy Spirit to guide them into understanding and coming to, to a full comprehension of this. Now, unfortunately, both the book of Acts as well as many of the writings in the book and letters of, of, of Paul, we find that uh, there were many that were not on board with this. They were not so humble. They were not so teachable. And, uh, and, and so not all uh, we're on the same page. And so when we come to books like Galatians and some of the writings in Ephesians and other places, many places actually in the letters of Paul, uh, we, it reveals that there were some within the Christian church among the original Christians that accepted Jesus as the Messiah and Savior of the world, but they only did it on an intellectual basis. In other words, they had only allowed it to enter into here but not down in here. And, uh, and so there was a whole world of difference, isn't there? And so perhaps a Christian had faithfully brought him through, like we do in our prophecy seminars. They had brought different individuals, different Jewish counterparts in, in, the, in, the, in Israel, and walked them through all those dozens of prophecies in the Old Testament that shows all these amazing details hundreds of years beforehand in the birth, the death, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And when they saw that, they were intellectually compelled to see that there was no one that could fulfill this except Jesus, the promised Messiah. And so they intellectually accepted Jesus as the Messiah, but they didn't open their heart to Jesus. And so there was a world of difference. And that world of difference brought some very serious challenges uh, to the church. 
And so there was two serious threats that were brought to the church because there were some that didn't have this heart experience. They weren't really born again as Jesus had taught in John chapter 3. They weren't fully in that conversion experience. What are the two threats that they brought to the churches in the province of Galatia that Paul is writing so strongly against? Well, the first challenge is this, that they appointed themselves, they would go into these churches, and they would appoint themselves to compel all new believers to observe a ceremonial of law of Moses, of course, including that of circumcision. Number two, they were also convincing the church members that the observance of the law, the works of the laws, it's sometimes also referred to, was a power in of itself to save us and to change us. Now, Paul was very concerned about both of these challenges, to be sure. In fact, both these threats he saw as a very serious threat to the church and to his new converts, to his new believers, in not only the province of Galatia, but in all areas in which he had been winning different people to Christ and uh, to the gospel. But I believe that Paul was more concerned about threat number two than even threat number one. And thus we find that he's writing more concerning that than even concerning the first threat. So again, with today being a natural summary in the study and conclusion of this particular book, we can safely say that the book of Galatians was a powerful defense of true internal conversion above all things. In other words, Paul saw that that second threat was threatening the conversion experience, the born again experience of these precious believers. Paul knew by personal experience that the law was powerless to change the heart. He knew that only Christ, through the Holy Spirit, can do that special work. He knew that we needed Christ. He knew that it was essential for us to have the Holy Spirit. And now there were Judaizers in the camp that were pointing people to the religion of the flesh. And that's why we see two key words that continue to come up all the way through the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation. Are we in Revelation? No, we're in the book of Galatians, aren't we? Okay, so all the way through the book of Galatians, we find that flesh and spirit are repeated over and over and over again. And so in summary, we find here that there were those who were trying to reconvert those who are in the church back to a religion of the flesh rather than a religious experience in the spirit. And this is very critical for us to be able to understand and pull away from the book of, of Galatians. And I'm just summarizing many of what the other pastors and teachers have taught already over the last uh, three months. There's a popular teaching today, and we find it in our uh, popular talk shows. We can find all kinds of books that have been making money for different authors over the last few decades. In fact, I can still remember I was only just a teenager some 30, 40 years ago, and and, uh, and already it was a popular movement. It's called the New Age Movement. Everybody's heard of the New Age Movement. In fact, it's been around so often, it, so long, it's not really all that new, is not it? Is it? In fact, even when it came out and called itself the New Age Movement, the fact of the matter there is that the devil has been recycling that teaching uh, since the Garden of Eden. Uh, so it's actually ironic uh, a name for it. It's a, 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 a false name because it's really not all that new. Finding the God within you. Have you ever heard that term? Okay, I remember watching Oprah or something one day and you know she's got a guest on there trying to convince us all that you know that all of us if we just find the God within us we're all going to be way better people. We're going to find perfect harmony around the world. You're going to be prosperous. Everything is going to fall into place and everything is going to be wonderful in your life. If you just find the God within you, tap into your inner power and follow your heart. Okay, now this is all at the heart of this very popular teaching. And by the way, this is not just found outside of the Christian circles, but it's also made its way sometimes into Christian circles as well. And so we're not safe just within the church. We need to be able to understand that some of these things are also challenging us from within. And so we need to be able to know what is being talked about here. And the reason I'm bringing it up now is because it really, in principle, is, is really the same as what the Judaic religion had become by the time Paul and his generation were living in Bible times and in New Testament times. And so it's important for us to be able to understand that. 
Now, I've got a text that kind of just says the exact opposite of follow your heart. Now, I know it sounds romantic. It sounds wonderful. I feel all warm inside when I hear, you know, just follow your heart. And you've you know, see it on some of our family movies and so on. You know, if you just follow your heart, everything's going to be okay. Well, this is what the Bible has to say about the human heart. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 says it the most uh, bluntly. And that is, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And who can know it? Now, does that make you all feel warm and fuzzy inside? Not at all, does it? Okay, so it's not nearly as popular as the uh, kind of Disney slogan and, and, and lines that we find so often being propagated. If you just follow your heart, everything's going to be warm and fuzzy and everything's going to be okay. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, don't follow your heart. Follow Jesus. Amen. Right? Okay, so the devil comes along and says, oh, just follow your heart. Let's all be warm and fuzzy together. God says, no, don't follow your heart. It's just deceitful. It's follow Jesus. If you follow Jesus, you're in good stead. Amen. Then you're safe. Then things are going to go much better for you. And not only that, but then you're going to live forever in perfect harmony and love for all of eternity. And, uh, and so don't let the devil deceive you. And so there's modern versions of that in which Paul, Paul in the Galatians is speaking against for us even as we look at this important subject. So I think it's helpful for us to understand that Paul was once a very zealous follower of the religion according to the flesh and not according to the spirit. Paul was there. He'd already experienced that for the bulk of his life, at least as a growing boy and then in the early years of his life as a man. He knew all about that experience. In fact, let's just review that. We're in Galatians already. Let's back up to a chapter that we studied just three months ago. In Galatians chapter 1, and verses 13 through 14. Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. And it says this. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I, perform, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries. In other words, he's saying, listen, I was a star student. In fact, in other letters, he writes that he was at the, at the feet of the most, uh, the most uh, prestigious rabbi and teacher of his generation, Gamaliel. And so his parents must have been very wealthy and had invested or sacrificed a lot to be able to put their boy at the feet of the most expensive, most prestigious Judaic teacher there was. And so he's listening. And then he said, I was at the top of my class when it comes to the Judaic religion and experience. In my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of the, of my fathers, okay? So there's the tradition, and there's, again, a very important clue that tells us that Judaism was more than just what Moses wrote by the time Paul came along. A large part of the Judaic experience was a lot of this extracurricular stuff that had been developed for the centuries uh, before Paul through the fathers. And so there's a lot of traditional junk, if I could put it frankly, that came with uh, what Moses had brought to the people at Mount Sinai. And so Paul and Jesus before that were speaking and preaching and teaching very strongly against that. And so once upon a time, in fact, no, sorry, I want to go back. Let's go to Philippians uh, before we go ahead. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at two texts, two different passages that give us some clues on where Paul was at uh, before he um, before he found Christ. And so Philippians chapter 3 and, and we're going to start with verse 2. It says, beware of dogs. Now he's not talking about Gentiles in this case. We just talked about Gentiles. And dogs. It's not, he's talking about, he's referring now to dogs as false brethren. He's talking about wolves within the sheep of, uh, of uh, within the sheep of, of the church and the church is Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Now he's talking about circumcision. Now, he's not into mutilation, but he's referring to circumcision in a negative way now because of the way that it's been abused among the Gentiles. For we are of the circumcision. Now, he's not talking about physical circumcision now, but he's talking about spiritual circumcision. And we're going to look at some texts if we have time before our time is up for study today and look at some texts that explain that. For we are of the circumcision who worship God in the... The spirit, there's that key word again, spirit. Remember, flesh and spirit are the key words of Galatians. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the 
flesh. So there's the other key word, isn't it? Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has confidence in the flesh, I the more so. He's saying, listen, if anyone could brag about having confidence in the flesh, I was a star. I was a champion. Okay? I was the, uh, what do they call the MVP? Most valuable player? I was the MVP of Judaism. Circumcision on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was one of the rare remaining purebreds of one tribe. Concerning the law, a Pharisee, the most strictest sect of Judaism. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, he said. I was a champion of the law. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. And Isaiah, of course, calls our righteousness like filthy rags, doesn't he? Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. Now, I have to confess, when I came to this particular passage, I was tempted to go into the imputed, in the imparted righteousness of Christ, in the gospel of Jesus, and so on. And, and then I remembered that not only do I not have time for that today, um, but there's lots of time to study this in the next quarterly. And so I don't want to steal the thunder of the next quarterly as we look in the first chapters of Romans and look at the ins and outs of the imputed and the imparted righteousness of Christ and how that gives us victory. But today, let's stick with conversion. Let's just stick with uh, conversion today. Once upon a time, Paul was without the Holy Spirit, and he looked to the law, both the ceremonial law, the moral law, the traditions of the fathers, and he looked to the works of the law to find fulfillment and salvation. And essentially, if we were to boil all of the book of Galatians down into one saying that Paul, perhaps, if he was speaking today in our modern language, would say, been there, done that, Never go back again. And so Paul is taking this very personally as well as theologically when he's writing to his Galatian churches. I want to have a bit of an exercise uh, with the last few minutes that we have here together. And, uh, and the exercise is looking at Paul before and after he finds Christ in the Spirit. And uh, so I start with the question, what kind of person did Paul become in his previous religious experience? What kind of person did Paul become with his previous religious experience before Christ? Zealous. Okay, zealous, somebody says, yes. In fact, let's look at some scriptures on that. Now, there's many scriptures in the book of Acts and the letters of Paul himself, but I want to invite you to come with me to Acts chapter 7. And Luke was inspired to write a very important milestone in the history of church as well as in prophecy. In fact, Acts chapter 7 is the recording, the event that really is the culmination and the last and, and the, uh, the end of one of the longest time prophecies in Daniel, Daniel 9. We've been studying that on Tuesday nights for those of you who've been coming. Those of you who've been watching on Facebook online, we've been looking at Daniel 9 and discovering that that last 70th week of the 70 week prophecy that represents seven literal years came to its conclusion three and a half years after Christ died and resurrected. And this is the, the last appeal that God is making to the council and the representatives of the nations of Israel. So the context that we come to in, in Acts chapter 7 and the event that's taking place is that God had instilled upon one of the first deacons, his name was Stephen. And Stephen was called to be a deacon, but God had also worked through him to work miracles. And we find that in the first verses of that chapter. And so he was doing many signs and wonders. Most of those signs, like Jesus, were inevitably healing people supernaturally. Now, Stephen was just like Jesus, and he was like Paul and Peter and the others that were also given this gift and were mir working miracles. Uh, he, they weren't doing it for a show. They weren't doing it to entertain the people. It wasn't a Las Vegas magician show that they were trying to act. No, they were doing that to show, first of all, that there is a living supernatural God that exists, and they are the ones that are worshiping the, the real God. Uh, but just as importantly, it was revealing that that same God loves you and that he cares about you and that he wants you to be whole and so we find here that jesus is revealing that god cares and loves the people that stephen was interacting with and then 
after they got their trust in there and, show, and revealed that not only did they care, but Stephen cared, then Stephen would go and preach the gospel to those same people. And so this was an inroad to be able to bring the gospel to its listeners and to those who were seeing and receiving the miracles. Well, there's a very prestigious synagogue that was existing in Jerusalem at that time. It was called the Synagogue of the Freedmen. And it was an international synagogue that had different, very prestigious uh, uh, Jews and leaders, a religious, political, probably, I'm sure, in there as well, that, that came from different nations and, and, and cities, even as Paul was likely in that uh, synagogue as well, as he was from uh, Tarsus, way up north. And, uh, and so Paul was a star Jew. He was a star Pharisee. And he was also on the council of the Sanhedrin of, of Jerusalem and of Israel. And they heard about this great preaching and power of Stephen, and so they went to publicly dispute. And Paul was, was, was kind of like, uh, um, you know, one of these great debaters. And he would start to debate, and he thought, okay, I'm going to clean this guy up uh, and, and wipe him off the table. And, and he lost. The Bible tells us in verse 2 that he lost, and the others that tried it lost as well. And, and, and so their pride was broken, and uh, so they went back and they did plan B, just like they did with Jesus. They went and got some false rumors going amongst the people, and they rounded up some false witnesses, and then they called Stephen before the council and said, hey, listen, you know, we've got witnesses, we've got rumors, uh, you know, uh, this is it, you're charged. And uh, so God inspires Stephen to give this last appeal to this council that represented Israel. And he starts to trace the covenant from Abraham, and he's going to move all the way to Jesus as the promised seed of Abraham. But he didn't get past Saul. He, go, he started to trace all the way through this very long chapter. By the time we get to verse 51, we find here that the people, were, their listeners, were becoming so upset. Their countenance, their expressions were becoming so mean looking and, uh, and likely even verbally interrupting uh, Stephen that Stephen just knew he wasn't going to get to the punchline and so he cuts his speech short in verse 51 he addresses them very frankly he said you stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did so do you and so this is describing Paul he's part of the, res of the group that, that Stephen is addressing and so we find that Paul was stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. And so he was a very hard-hearted man. So that's the first thing that we find that Paul was the kind of person he was. Uh, number two, he resisted the Holy Spirit. And so he was in the habit of pushing back the voice of the conscience and of the Holy Spirit in his life. And then we come to verse 53. It says, Who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. And so now Stephen is kind of speaking more frankly than ever, and he's kind of putting himself on the line now because he's exposing the lives of those in who are listening. Now, you don't expose the most powerful, most prestigious religious and political leaders and embarrass them in this way. Your life is on the line if you do it. And the following verses prove that, don't they? They demonstrate that because they went out and they killed Stephen that day. What, what parts of the law did Paul not keep that day? What parts of the law did Paul not keep? Well, in the very heart of the law, Leviticus, the writings of Moses itself, Leviticus 19, verse 18 says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, was Paul loving his neighbor as himself? No, not that day anyway. Okay, did he love neighbors as himself afterwards when he persecuted and imprisoned Christians simply because they believed in something different on a religious basis than he did? No. So he was breaking the second greatest commandment in the law of Moses. Number two, Jesus put it another way, by the way. He said, the golden rule is, do unto others as you would have done unto yourselves. Now, if we switch the tables that day, and Stephen and his deacons and Christians had the upper hand, and they were the authorities, and they, Paul, they dragged Paul in front of them and said, listen, you either accept Christ as the Messiah, or we kill you. Okay, do you think he would appreciate that? No, Paul wouldn't appreciate that at all. So was Paul doing unto others as he would have done unto him? No, no, not at all. Okay, and then uh, what about do good to love your enemies? Did Paul do good and love his enemies? No, he counted Stephen and the Christians as an enemy, and he wasn't doing good to them at all. Proverbs 25, verse 21 says this, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he's thirsty, give him 
something to drink. In the heart of the law of Moses, Exodus chapter 23 and verse 4, it says, If your enemies, if you see or meet your enemy's ox or donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. And so these principles that Jesus drew out in the Sermon on the Mount were not new. They were new to their listeners, but they weren't new to Moses or to the Bible. Paul should have been acquainted with them as well. And then, of course, the fourth part of the law that Paul was breaking on a serious uh, matter was the sixth commandment. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, it says, you shall, not, you shall not murder. Was Paul murdering that day? Sure. Okay, according to our justice system here in America, he would be an accomplice to murder, wouldn't he? Okay, verse, chapter 8, verse 1, it says, now Paul had consented to his death. Paul was the one that was watching the coats of those who were picking up the rocks and throwing the stones at Saul until Saul was, was killed. And so Paul was guilty and of accomplice to murder. After that, he was directly involved in having Christians murdered and imprisoned as, as well. And so uh, uh, he was a lawbreaker, even though he claimed himself to be a champion of the law. And uh, so the following verses go on and explain how they uh, responded and, and, and the group eventually uh, dragged Saul out, uh, I mean, uh, Stephen out and had him stoned until he was absolutely, completely gone. And then there was a persecution. Verse 3, it says, as, Saul, as for Saul, he had made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging men and women, committing them to prison. And so he was arrogant, he was zealous, he was intolerant to religious disagreement. He was easily angered. And Jesus calls that kind of uh, condition like a whitewashed sepulcher or tomb. You're all beautiful on the outside, but inside you have dead men's bones and all kinds of uncleanness. And Jesus himself spoke to the Pauls of his generation while Jesus was on the earth. So what changed Paul so dramatically? The very next chapter, verse 17 and 18, is what we're going to have to close with here today. Verses 17 and 18, it says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you, as, as you, saw, as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell before his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized. What's the key ingredient that he received that day? The Holy Spirit. Now he was of the experience of the Spirit. You see, the power is not in the law itself to change us. The power is in Christ, the God of the law. And once you have the God of the law in your heart, then God is able to write his law upon your heart. And that's the whole goal, isn't it? For us to be able to keep the law from the inside out. And that's what Paul was concerned of. That's what God was concerned of as well. Well, we want to thank you for studying with us here today. And uh, those of you who are online or watching on TV, and uh, I just want to remind you one more time that there is a free offer that's available called Hidden Eyes and Closed Ears by Joe Cruz. Hidden Eyes and Closed Ears. And, uh, and uh, that's uh, offer number 726. And you can just simply dial 1-866-788-3966. 866 788 3966 or 866 study more that's offer number 726 just call in if you're in north america or as territories and we'll send that to you god bless you and we look forward to studying with you next week 500 years ago god used martin luther to inspire a great reformation however in the centuries that followed the church has slipped off the bedrock of truth into the valley of lukewarm worldliness that's why this fall, I'll be presenting a brand new nine-part series called Foundations of Faith. Please plan now to join me in person, online, or on television, and be sure to invite others to join you as well. The Reformation continues. Let's face it, it's not always easy to understand everything you read in the Bible. With over 700,000 words contained in 66 books, the Bible can generate a lot of questions. To get biblical, straightforward answers, call into Bible Answers Live, a live nationwide call-in radio program where you can talk to Pastor Doug Batchelor and ask him your most difficult Bible questions. For times and stations in your area or to listen to answers online, visit bal.amazingfacts.org. Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at aftv.org.
At AFTV.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.org.